Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Strength in the Numbers. Now for those of you familiar with the show, you're probably aware it's based very much around the mentoring principle of us sharing our stories with each other around what works well and what could perhaps work better in particular circumstances so the rest of us have a rough idea of how to get the most out of our careers in finance and accounting. And some of us maybe have even mentored others. I mean, some of us maybe have mentored one other colleague or fellow professional, maybe 10, 50. But how about someone who's mentored 700 other professionals in finance and accounting and done so in the last year alone? Well, that's why I share with you today our guest mentor, Dawal Parvadikar, and he goes through how he managed to do this, as well as deconstruct on today's show, uh, the common questions that young accountants are having about their careers and how we can go about maybe answering them. We delve into how to best develop ourselves in the right way to begin to learn how to better understand the business, as well as develop and build those relationships to help us get things done. And finally, when we've loads to do, how do we manage scope creep? So we actually get those things done. So we touch on ideas of leveraging uh, virtual coffee breaks, regular monitoring of timesheets, and also the regular sending of insights to management. So look, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, you can check out the detailed timestamp show notes, key quotes, resources, and ways to connect with our guest mentor and more at sitnshow.com. And we really appreciate when you share the show with your friends and colleagues so that they can access the key insights and advice of the guest mentors who come onto the show so that they can go on to have more rewarding and successful careers themselves. So look, that's enough for me. So without further ado, over to Dawal and the show. So welcome to the show, Dawal. Hi, Andrew. I'm I'm super excited to be here. You know, it's kind of a little fanboy moment for me, because I have been following your podcast since last three years all the thought leaders on LinkedIn from the last three years. And I was wondering when would my turn come to be on SITN? And I had no clue that it's going to be so fast. And I'm super excited. Hey, look, I mean, it's, uh, it's, no, it's interesting. I'm delighted you say that. I'm actually more delighted to have you on the show, Dawal. And, you know, one of the key things I just love to share with our our audience is you did an article series recently. And it was really, really much what the, the show is about. It's about mentoring, sharing experience, what wasn't working, what was working for you. Right. And, you know, across that last decade or so and, and, and sharing those thoughts, I thought that was really sort of brave of you. And then when we got speaking, I couldn't get over just how many people you have been mentoring over the last number of years. I mean, uh, do you want to sort of share some of those activities with our audience? Yeah, I started something called as uh, Saturday meetings, where I started reserving a Saturday for uh, speaking to you know, new recently qualified chartered accountants and finance professionals. So like I was at the same place when you know, I was confused in the beginning of my career as to what I like and what I don't like, what is the direction, what further qualifications should I do, what should I not do. So all those kind of questions, you know, bother the young child accountants uh, in their early days. So I thought, let me share my experience and try and help them figure out their interest. So it's been like 700 one-to-one calls. And I've also got a online mentoring program. So I collected all the common questions and just put it into an online uh, video series, like it's a 15 part uh, small video series, which kind, uh, kind of addresses the common questions that come up during these mentoring calls. So it has been an exciting experience. There's so much to learn from the younger uh, lot as well. Kind of makes me feel a little bit outdated, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> hopefully, I'm adding to their, uh, adding some value to their careers. Yeah, it's, it's, you make me feel a lot better when you say that because, like, I probably feel a few years in more into my career than you are, Dawal. And if you say like we're sort of like playing catch up a bit, it's um, <laughs> it's it's good. It's good. That's what we want. The future we want the the, the profession, our community to be developing. But the point I, I get, I hope our audience picked up on it. Over seven hundred conversations. I mean, yep. that's just yep. unreal. Um, so 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 look, one thank you for doing that for our profession. But it's the same sort of you know, uh, reasons for the show, right? It's uh, just common themes come up and it just gives people an opportunity to understand them, deconstruct them, figure out what the right path is to take. So I really appreciate you doing that. But how did you, how, like, I know like you, you know, you're helping people answer these questions, but how did you get into wanting to do finance mentoring or mentoring others in our profession? How did you get into it? 
I just kind of, you know, started having conversations with my friends, you know, who were confused about the direction of their career. I mean, and some of them were like two, three years junior to me. And then they had all these kind of questions as to what further course should we pursue? What area should be there? Can I move from internal audit to finance? And all these kind of common questions started uh, coming up. I thought because I have worked across different industries and different kinds of companies, uh, European MNC, you know, and American MNC, uh, Indian PSU for that matter, public sector undertaking, which is a government uh, company. So all the, all these variety of experience, I thought, uh, you know, I have seen at least more kind of different profiles, if not worked in. But so that I thought, let me share this experience with the younger lot so that they can figure out. So somebody who's getting into, let's say, uh, global shared services and is confused whether he, can he come out of a glo global shared services or can he uh, pivot it into an fp &A role at some point in time? Of course they can. They need to cert develop certain skills and uh, probably equip themselves with certain maybe courses, but it's always doable. So all these kind of apprehensions which they have, I thought my experience can help them, you know, address these apprehensions. So that's how it all started. It just started with one call on one Saturday okay. and then it kind of just <laughs> spiraled into, I, at some point in time, I started taking calls on weekdays as well during my commute. I have a one and a half hour commute. So I thought, let me take, let me utilize that as well for some calls. So that's how I was able to do about 700 calls. Oh no, that that that's incredible. So I know that well. That's that's what it's, it just out of interest. Of like, um, you must get so much variety in there. And yes, there are common ones. What would be the common, most common questions on the minds of, I suppose, the our younger members of our profession that some of the senior leaders listening to this and and, and you know right. people more into their careers could help their sort of younger, more junior colleagues better understand and, and work with. The most common question what I get is that what further course should they do? Like if they complete their chartered accountancy, should they go for a SEMA or a CPA or something like that? Because it's such a competitive environment out there. Nobody's just happy with one qualification. Yeah. They always want multiple qualifications. But what I have personally realized is that qualifications are only an entry ticket into the corporate world. I always somehow coach them to kind of work on both your qualifications and your skills. Degrees are fine, but it's, a, it's the combination of degrees plus skills is what is going to give you that professional success. So I just encourage them that don't just be on one track that, you know, start holding degrees, you know, uh, maybe completing CA, then SEMA, then CPA. Just, just don't collect those degrees. They are of no use. Try to understand the skill sets behind the finance function. What are the skill sets required? Like, for example, building relationships is the most important skill set, which I feel for a finance professional, otherwise he won't be able to, he or she won't be able to add any value to their roles. So that's how I coach them. And that's the most common question I get. Although I encourage them to go for multiple degrees, but after a certain time in their career, like at least spend three to four years in their, in, in some job and figure out what their interests are, what they like and what they don't like, and then go for a for the qualification and just, you know, don't, just don't start hoarding qualifications just for the sake of it. Yeah, I was, it's obviously you're a listener to the show, Dawa, because you, you didn't even have to wait for me to ask how would we deconstruct the next steps there that uh, the audience could do to, to figure out what, how, how to, to do, you know, pursue the right things, you know, and, and that's what it comes back to really figuring out what it is they like, because if you're doing more of what right. you like, you're going to be able to bring your best efforts and so on. And, it, and, it, and, you know, I know it's work to some degree, but it doesn't feel as much like work. So, so no, I, I really appreciate oh. you sharing that. And I suppose in terms of your own career, you know, I'd, I'd love to go through that a bit. As you said, you sort of worked in various different environments. So would you maybe right. mind taking us through a brief, brief journey on your own career? Sure. So I completed my chartered accountancy and uh, started with a company called Bharat Petroleum. It's the second largest uh, oil and gas company in India. So there I was handling uh, pricing for industrial fuels and uh, management accounting. So looking after the profitability, the regional profitability, product profitability and all that stuff. And after that, uh, I moved to a company called Trafigura. It's apparently the second largest commodity trading company in the world. So it was a shared services setup. It was completely different from the, the role which I had in uh, in Bharat Petroleum. So it was a shared services setup looking after uh, the overheads accounting and management reporting mm -hmm. across around 1,500 legal entities spread across 80 wow. different countries. It was a huge setup and huge volume. So there I was, again, part looking at management uh, accounting, uh, then again, budgeting, variance analysis, forecasting, all that stuff. Uh, last five years, I have been interestingly associated with advertising industry. So that's that's a big switch from oil and gas to commodity trading to 
advertising. Yeah. So last five years, I have been associated with advertising and marketing industry, uh, which is more of a professional services setup where if, if one of the key executives exit, a bunch of clients go along with them. So it's it's that difficult to manage <laughs> manage the finances there. So somehow I started liking, uh, you know, being in advertising and last, my, last two of my companies have been into advertising and uh, marketing. And uh, so here again, I'm I'm handling uh, like currently I'm looking at uh, I'm handling uh, finances for a company called Fleshman Hillard. It's into communications and public relations. It's an American firm. I head the India finance team, and I report to the regional CFO who's based out of Hong Kong. Uh, again, my role is pretty much handling everything end-to-end -end finance, then strategy as well, spending time with the CEOs and the general managers to make sure. Uh, everything is fine, all the resourcing, profitability, everything is going correct. The transition has been very fast from a junior to a senior role. But to some extent, I feel that I prepared towards it. When I started look, like looking at my next role, when I was working for my previous company, I thought first I should prepare myself. Like for example, if I'm aiming, aiming for a finance controller role, you yeah. know, mentally am I a finance controller first, right? Oh, great one, yes. Right? And to some extent, spending years won't make you really probably grow to that level but mentally are you prepared are you working on your skill sets which are required for that kind of a role so that's how i started and it took probably three years for me to land that <laughs> first financial finance controller role with or the leadership role which i would say but the preparation behind it was you know pretty much what i mean i, I love that preparation and not many people are willing to invest in that yeah and they just expect that by spending the number of years they will get to the next level yeah, which probably, you know, in their defense, though, well, that's probably how it used to work, you know, like years ago, you know, it yeah. was about how many years you were turning up or whatever. But yeah. but to your point, I always wonder, I agree with you. I mean, people don't do that investment of time to think about, you know, and sort of what it is they want from the career. What does the ideal role look like? What are the type of conversations you'd have in that role? Um, you know, what industry even what it is? Are you leading a team? Are you part of a team? Who are you speaking to on a daily basis or monthly basis? What type of activities? People don't really think about their, their careers and that. They seem to come in day to day and wonder why they're probably not feeling, I know, fully engaged with the role. So why why don't why don't more of us think about what, what ideal role we want in, in accounting and finance? Because there's great roles and opportunities there. To some extent, I had read a statistic somewhere. Um, I don't recollect the source, but it said that less than 3% of the people are actually investing in their own career development, which means 97% of the people just expect that time will bring them promotions <laughs> and growth. Yes. This is not true. And no wonder 3% people are uh, leading the organization. Well, there, there you go. I think, I, think, I think that's it. So how, how do we make that 3%, 4%? Is that going to be possible or even that 4%, 10%? Is, can, can we do that? Can we do anything there? From our end, we can just coach the younger generation just to keep developing themselves as much as possible. That's what we can do. I mean, to some extent, it's that self-realization that, uh, or if you try to deconstruct the mindset of any any young chartered accountant, especially in India, I can give you some examples that mm -hmm. they think they know everything about the business. Like when they, <laughs> when they complete chartered accountancy, they, of course, they are yeah, armed yeah. with financial knowledge and profitability and all of that stuff. But that doesn't mean that they know everything about business. There's so many yeah, other things to know. I'm gonna I that one, I'm gonna cover there. I was probably the same when I qualified. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people would have said You're that. <laughs> so it's the same. It was the same in the UK and Ireland. I can guarantee that. <laughs> we all start there. We all start there. It's only when I when I joined a management program where I was introduced to different elements of general management, uh, you know, supply chain, marketing, uh, knowledge management, HR, all of that stuff. I realized that my knowledge is so, so limited when it comes to business management. That was my realization. And I started working towards learning more of business management and less of uh, finance after that. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's great. I, and actually, I have to say, like to, to what you were saying, maybe that explains the mindset why some people are thinking, right, I need to get as many bits of paper, qualifications, um, they're the more artifacts of uh, yeah. more yeah. tangible, you know, and, and, and whatever. And I think it's that sort of intangible piece the the relationships building and i think i think we've had conversations before uh, yes you know those dashboards and the new technologies are great like shiny objects but really yeah. relationships building those so so the, the the people who you think sort of maybe could probably spend a bit more time on the relationships and developing that where, where's the best place to start interestingly i have in in the 10 years that i have been working now i've never worked with you know very uh, like like fancy tools and dashboards and this and that 
to some extent all my business finance roles have been about relationships <laughs> getting din- things done through some kind of influence you know relationships have worked better than dashboards to some extent you know having a coffee table conversation and probably explaining at some point in time on a tissue paper that you know this is how your profitability or your client pricing should be to, yes. to the sales guys you know that has worked in my favor to some extent rather than you know just preparing and sending some fancy dashboards again that emphasizes that relationship is the number one thing that finance uh, folks should focus on yeah i th- i think i think you're right i think it's a focus on relationships but uh, i'd also come in that you made a very important point it's about getting stuff done so if yeah. with the relationship without getting anything done off the back of it you know it's probably so a little bit of value some value but more right. value is actually using that relationship to get stuff done to go close right. deals to go change reports go do better analysis make better decisions and follow through and i think that's I think that's a very important you make like you know it's it's a progression to give you an example like in in advertising especially most of the clients are uh, retainer based clients that they have a certain standard set of uh, scope so the biggest problem which uh, or other the challenge which i have in my role is to ensure that there are no scope creeps from the clients so that requires regular monitoring of time sheets and making sure that we are delivering only what is there in the contract and not exceeding so as sales professionals uh, to some extent i mean if you you know if, if i was a sales professional i would always want to over deliver on my scope to the client but that comes at the cost of you know resourcing some other project so that balance needs to be managed so that is i think the most challenging element to me in the advertising world the scope creep managing that scope creep is is very important but uh, again with uh, with the partnership between sales finance and accountants and so on like we've got great skills to make sure that uh, we manage scope creep and i think that's that's the same thing again when it comes to doing things with the relationships isn't it it's like having right. the relationships getting the seat at the table and and making sure people stick to what they say they're going to do <laughs> you right. know and managing scope creep I, I, is there any sort of um is there any sort of ways you could share with our audience how you manage that uh, not just in your job but maybe in general what the rest of us could follow I mean, a couple of things which you know I especially do is uh, spend at least two to three hours every day with the business guys. You know, probably have coffee with them. You know, uh, just discuss with them how their projects are going, what's keeping them busy. A general chit chat gives you a lot of insights, and then mm-hmm. we can come back and check or correlate them with the timesheets. That okay, <laughs> if they are spending some spending some time working on a pitch, I mean, how how much time have they spent, and what's the probability that we can land that client? Uh, how strong are our chances? That's number one. Number two is again regular monitoring of timesheets. and sending insights to the the general managers right like for example what what kind of how much time are they spending towards a particular client or like are they giving are they spending more time or less time who has spent what time what what top 5 clients are there which are which are occupying most of our time yeah. so maybe our time sheet deeper time sheet analysis is what and and the insights from it into a small maybe an excel table or a dashboard right you know send it to the body of the mail and not really a long spreadsheet with a lot of hundreds and thousands of time sheet line yeah. items that i think can help the gms as well plus it helps build your own credibility that okay this guy is uh, monitoring this and also he wants profitability on our clients so they understand that you know this guy is monitoring not just because policing around but he is he wants us to do better so that relationship bit the coffee does the relationship bit and the dashboard does the insights bit which is a which is a combination that i prefer yeah i i think so i think that i think that's a great way of exp- explaining i think um the effort you put in building relationships the rapport um you know uh, nowadays i think virtual coffees are quite a big thing <laughs> with us, a lot of us being stuck at home yeah <laughs> so that's true. there's plenty of time out there where you're not commuting you know as much anymore um and then and then obviously doing something with it i i like to sort of imagine that monitoring like see a financial cctv system into the business to so you keeping um, an eye out for their blind spots they can't see everything uh, and right. you might see something on one set of accounts that they you could leverage on another set of accounts and that's showing that you're there to you've got their backs and you want to see them be successful i think that's key so i love i love right. that that's that summarizing uh, their um their their well and i suppose look you've been giving us great advice uh, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received okay from a career point of view i mean looking at your career in blocks of 2 to 3 years there was a director finance uh, in my first job as i said in bharat petroleum so when during our induction he gave us this advice that was the first job the first day of my job so he gave us this advice that says look at your careers in blocks of 2 to 3 years and what you're doing in block 3 to 5 should be different from what you're doing in block 1 to 3 
So, and you should you should keep growing. Your either your role should change, your role should grow, or your or you should be part of, part of a different team, or you should be leading a team. So, always every three to four years, you should keep yourself upgrading and doing different things. And I think, pretty much to some extent, by default, that has uh, fallen in place in my career. That I think to me was the best advice that I got. That look at your career in blocks of two to three years, and then work towards your next block. I think that, that that's fantastic. Um, you know, and we had a great uh, line manager, great boss to, to share that with you. Um, I've had great ones along the way. They just never shared that with me. I had to figure that one out for myself. But it it does it does help put it in perspective. But I sort of did it retrospectively. So no, that's really great advice for audience. I encourage them to to think about it in that way. And then I suppose would there be any resources that you might recommend or a audience check out that you found particularly useful? So first of all, I mean, I have a bit of reading one LinkedIn article a day. You know, I just take out 10, 15 minutes uh, during the lunch time, just after lunch. Uh, instead of just spending time here and there or surfing the net, I just like to read one LinkedIn article every day. Hopefully, if you are doing it, if you're reading articles from the thought leaders in your industry, that uh, that would be great. The other resource is doing online courses. And I'm a big fan of online courses. From 2017 till now, in the last three years, I've done thousands of hours of online courses, including from digital marketing to strategy, you know, all of that. So online courses are my favorite. The other thing is a couple of books, not much. I'm not a voracious reader, but I just love a couple of books. One is that book uh, where it's about the turnaround story of... Uh, IBM that's who says elephants can't dance All right. that's an amazing book where interesting choice yeah why, why would you recommend that one I haven't read that one why would you recommend it to some extent as a finance professional we are always enthusiastic about you know turning around or turnaround stories we like turnaround stories somehow we love turnaround stories so I think who says elephants can't dance is a perfect example like how a mammoth organization like IBM which was suffering in losses how can it be turned around by just know one person or just focusing on one single strategy you know to some extent that that to me was really fascinating Lou Jostner has who's who was the CEO who did that yes. I think it's just an amazing story and I, I, I love that story yeah and, and, and it could be very useful for now as well right you know with um, Absolutely. a lot of companies yeah. having to furlough or, or, or lay off resources getting companies back up again you know, go, so we some useful lessons. He integrated a lot of things. Well, IBM grew so fast that everything started getting decentralized very fast. To some mm -hmm. extent, for him to maintain that balance between the centralization and decentralization, I think that was the key. That's that's one of the biggest lessons that we can learn from that story. Where what decisions you want to keep it, you know, at the center, and what decisions do you want to decentralize. So I think that that was the key uh, takeaway for me from that book. Then the other book is, uh, I think, How to Influence and Influence People. That's like we spoke before, that relationship is the number one skill that finance, finance guys should work on. So I think that's that's a great book that I would recommend everybody to read. And probably read at least, read once at least every two, three years. Oh, you have to. Yeah, like, I, yeah, have to. And why, why would you recommend doing that? We tend to forget. I mean, we, we always like new concepts and new things and we, we implement them for a couple of months and after that we forget. So probably I'm not a big fan of reading like one book a week and all of that, but I like certain set of books, which probably I like to go back to them, uh, you know, regularly, you know, that's, that's, that has been my style. Like I'm, and many people say that leaders are, uh, sorry, leaders are readers. Yeah. Leaders are readers. So many people read one book a week or recommend reading that to some extent, I feel that you should at least have your 10, 15 set of pillar, you know, pillar books, what I would call them. Yeah, so you should go back to these books every now and then. So when you forget, forget to implement them, just remain as... Um, what, I, what I was going to say, though, was um, when you sort of said leaders are readers, I think to your point, they tend to read the same core 15 to 20 books uh, repeatedly because some of the ideas and principles in it are timeless. Like, like How to Win yeah. Friends and Influence People has to be my most favorite book of all time. But like Absolutely. yourself, I have yeah. to dip yeah. in again because... Because with everything going on, it's just easy to, to to forget things like, you know, and it's very well summarized and it's, it is a simple book and we should remember this thing off the bat, but you know, like it is important to dip in and dip out and um, it keeps, it keeps us grounded to very effective ways. So no, great recommendations, great recommendations. Um, should our audience wish to continue the conversation, where's the best place to connect with you at? You can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty much active on LinkedIn, you know, publishing articles and, you know, commenting every now and then. So I'm pretty much active on LinkedIn and uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can also check out my mentoring program on my website called trainforcorp.com. 
slightly a complicated name is train then four numerical four uh, corp c o r p dot com that's where i have my online programs and uh, people can check out there as well and i think link- linkedin is the number one way where to connect i know appreciate appreciate mentioning those that well and i'm going to put the links in the show notes for audience um, also our audience probably don't realize is that at the start of this it was a bit of uh, feedback so you turned the fan off so you must be as we say here absolutely melting um, <laughs> yeah. over in india there so thank you for thank yeah, you for so you, at least you didn't pass out on this uh, this uh, podcast so thank you very much for that um so we'll wrap up shortly but before we do do you have any maybe parting thoughts for our audience yeah again uh, i would say that you just focus on your skill sets as well just just don't hold degrees focus on skill set you know connect with as many people and thought leaders as you can on linkedin because it's it's the number one way where we can learn so many things and i have learned so many things uh, on linkedin and attended so many virtual conferences and webinars uh, read so many linkedin articles now and the the transformation in the last 2 years has been uh, completely amazing be on top of your game and don't ever be complacent just keep working on yourself and keep growing Awesome. I think that's a great, great advice to end the show. And so, Darwell, thank you for coming on, being a great guest mentor today on Strength in the Numbers. Completely my pleasure, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me, I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. When all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care. And let's keep building our strength in the numbers.